What I always found interesting was like, you know, centuries of tradition, and then someone's like, what if I did this? And, and it led to kind of this like, every day I'm on Instagram, I see some new person, and I don't mean this in a bad way, like being inspired and just loving it and being like, I love doing this. And then, you know, you have everything from, I actually brought some of Ben's uh, winning solvent list that he had given me two weeks ago. So it's, so it's also kind of like innovation in almost like consistency. He came, uh, he came yesterday to Yeah, the no, no, event. no, that, that's why when, yeah. when he posted that picture, I was like, she's in LA. He was like, yeah, and I was like, all right. Um, but so can you give kind of the quick backstory of, because it's two things. One is kind of the automated, almost like a, a yeah. automated dry sift, but then yeah. were you the first person to do it in ice water too? Yeah. So like you had- Not the first person to do it in ice water, but to figure out that the bags was the simplest way to do it in ice water. You know, so, so other people were doing it just loose. No, they were. They made this big machine that was all made of steel and wood and cost a bloody fortune. And I had to ship down six down to Australia, which cost even more of a fortune. And the problem was they'd all be made in Czechia or Yugoslavia. And at the bottom where there was this plastic funnel, they all exploded. So is this what he won for? Yeah. That's the, uh, the OG. banana OG. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, so if you think of when you were in like India, what was that, 40 years ago or 30 years ago? 30 years ago, yeah. Which is, you know, a, a, either a brick or a temple ball to kind of the innovation and consistency that you're seeing now. Like, are you excited to see kind of people playing with? I think it's uh, excellent. It would not be right if people were still only using the dry sift and the bags. Right. It's a very good thing that the innovation is happening. Whichever direction it's clay, taking it to solvent, to rosin, I must say I prefer the rosin to the solvent, but it's moving, you know, in any industry. They don't build houses like they did a hundred years ago. <laughs> Even the doctor <laughs> has a lot more happening right. for him than, uh, to use than uh, so. With this also, it's going to evolve, and I don't know exactly where it's going to be going, right. but uh, I feel kind of funny and proud to be the kind of beginning of it, or, yeah, with that machine, because that was the first mechanized system to separate the glands. And, and that was in what year? Are we talking? That was in, actually, I invented it in 92, 93, That's right, okay. but I didn't open a company until early 94. So this year, actually, at the New Year's Eve, will be around for 25 years. Okay. But when you first did it, and then you showed other people, were they like, that's genius? When we first did it, basically, I built a machine for myself because I, because <laughs> I wanted some good hash, and I lived in India for 14 years and traveled Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nepal, Kashmir. So I knew how hash was made in different regions. And then came back to Holland and suddenly the whole city is filled with coffee shops that sell weed. <laughs> and I'd never encountered weed to smoke in the 23 years I had been smoking hash. In the hash producing countries? Yeah. So I find that interesting that yeah, but when they I don't start, smoke the flour at all no. in any of those countries. No. Which all is the way, fascinating. All the way from um, uh, Morocco all the way to China. In the definitely in the northern whole area, you know, they'll smoke hash. Maybe in places like Thailand and South India, there will be some weed being smoked. But because when in '64 I started smoking in Amsterdam, there was also no weed. There was only hash, and it came from the sailors. You know, they traded with Lebanon, Pakistan, and brought some hash along for themselves to sell when they got to Amsterdam, and that's how we got first hash, so I never tasted uh, weed. On um, all my travels, there was always only hash. And I must say, I did, I think, one time try and smoke the Manali weed and thought it was awful compared to the hash. Right. So that was a one time only. <laughs> right. That's funny. So, so, all right, so you you create kind of the, the dry sift. sift. Yeah. And then who, who did you first see washing? 
No, the first um, news about water came from the States. Um, like, do you remember who was doing it? That Morrow, guy? Morrow. Uh, what's his name? Len Morrow. He was into um, uh, the terpenes like 10 years before anyone else had hardly heard of them. Okay. And he was the first one that I got word that he was using water. But it was just in a glass and there was no mention of ice. And you just put water and your product in there and stirred it up a bit. And we did it, made a big mess in the kitchen. I was doing this with Annie Ricken, who used to work for the High Times. And uh, there were actually some crystals, because the crystals are heavier, heavier than plant matter, so they will always sink, sink right. at the bottom. But by the time we got all that water and plant matter out, it was negligible what we <laughs> retrieved. <laughs> yeah. But from that, uh, slowly, slowly, then this machine came out, maybe about uh, six months, nearly a year later. And that because it showed the, it had a stainless steel bucket with a, uh, like a stirrer, like a pancake stirrer on it, mm -hmm. and then a screen, and then this plastic funnel with a cute little bottle hanging at the bottom. And it was great, except all of them broke. And I was just racking my brains. How can I do this system through the screen, in the water, with ice? By then, we'd figured that out. Uh, and just stick it in an envelope. And my uh, <laughs> career started as owning a boutique. So I knew all about cloth and clothes and sewing. So how to get a screen horizontal in a bucket yeah, you make the cloth that hangs over the bucket. So I stitched the very first ones myself that I've now donated to a mobile hash museum in Holland. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, and then later on, actually we ourselves were using the washing machine. And uh, that's my last uh, product in this line. Because washing machines were invented to wash your dirty socks clean and for a washing machine to have plant material in there with ice and everything, it does a perfect job, you know, it washes those crystals off and they end up in the runaway water and that you can catch in the bags, so. And so you created the bags and what, what was the reaction to kind of that innovation where people like, that's also genius. Like you are, no, no, you need no. to smoke more weed and come up with more ideas. No, no, no. The first time I remember we had a booth, I think it was maybe in Switzerland or even in Holland, I forget. And I'd hung the whole booth with bags and every single person walked by. They knew me from the pollinator, from the dry sift machine. And they just thought I'd gone mad. And they didn't see at all how these bags work. They just saw all these bags hanging there. <laughs> but then slowly, slowly the magazines caught on and wrote about it and Soma was a great lover of the bags originally. So that really helped promote it. And, right. Yeah. Very cool. And, and then <clears throat> when I think of kind of innovations and consistency, was there like a good decade where it was mostly just people doing ice water hash and making temple balls? And then you, like, no, when did you first start? Ice, ice water hash, you don't make bricks and temple balls. It's too precious. Well, I thought like, like Frenchie makes temple balls, right? Yeah. He definitely because uses ice water. Well, that's not old and traditional. Okay. In all my travels in Afghanistan, Pakistan, I never saw anyone use water. Apart when they had sifted the crystals, Sometimes they'd spit in it, sometimes they'd put a little water in it just to knead it together. But I never ever saw it, personally anyway. I, I guess my question is, when, when the kind of ice water first came on the scene, yeah. what was kind of the end consistency? Because now there's a variety of end consistencies. It uh, should come out like that, and if they are not greedy and wash too long or shake too long, because that's when the chlorophyll starts coming into it, I always say stop way before it starts going green. Um, it should look kind of like caviar, and this in the temperature of uh, 
LA has melted somewhat, so it's kind of all together. But you can still see the separate crystals. And if it was still dry, if it had been kept in a fridge the whole time, but why, it would it? look like caviar. You can see if you uh, have a, micro a microscope or nearly with your eye, you can see it's just built up of little crystals where on the top. You know, if it's pressed, it's going to be smooth, but here you see the crystals. Okay. And I think it's just melted in the heat, okay. and that's why it's all together now. Got it. <laughs> it smells good, though. It's very nice. So, so who... I voted for him in uh, my other, <laughs> and I didn't even know. <laughs> and it was so nice because Ben, who came to the show, he was the one who had made it. I know. Yes. Yeah. But then they had, he had to be here to something. Had to oh, be so he couldn't go to Miami. Lab. So he couldn't go to Miami. So he was so sad. And he said it was his first prize ever. <laughs> in, what is it? In absentia? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you kind of innovated on the equipment side. Yeah. And then a lot of people copied you. A lot of people copied me. And, and some how, of them. How did that make you feel? It used to make me very mad. And then I remembered I used to have a friend in the clothing business in New Delhi when I lived in India. And he always used to say, to be copied is the best compliment you can get. So I kind of have to make do with that. And it's not worth it to wind myself up about it because the only one who suffers from that is me. Right. You know, nobody, nobody else yeah, is going to feel bad. Yeah. For you. <laughs> no. Right. So that's just plain stupid right. to sit there and wallow in your shit. <laughs> well, so in terms of your business focus now, is what percentage of your time are you focused on kind of selling the equipment and then you're also running the Dabadoo stuff? And how, how many Dabadoos are there? Let's say let's say 2019, how many are there? Miami just happened. You're about to go to Columbia. Yeah, this year there will just be five because we didn't... It's difficult to find a location to do it in Holland now because in the Netherlands, um, extracts are illegal. So, to, and really? even rosin, they don't see that it's not really an extract, that it's just pressed. So hash is illegal in no. the Netherlands? No, hash like this and made with water because or dry it's not, it, So yeah. solventless yeah. extracts are okay, yeah. solvent yeah. is not okay. So the thing is that no business at the moment wants to rent to us to do this because they're scared of losing their license. You know, if they let us be there with all the sovereigns and Horosin and a few hundred people. So we haven't found a place in Holland. Oh, because, da da sorry, Dabadu also has a solvents category, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's three categories. So even though you're, I mean, do you smoke salt? Like, do you smoke live resin? Also, no, I smoke uh, the, the, I prefer this water hash to any other thing. But if somebody handed you some hydrocarbon, I've, I've tasted you'll it. try it. I'll try it, definitely. I'll try you'll, most you'll things. You'll show appreciation. <laughs> or not. <laughs> I don't like when it starts tasting of chemicals, you know that. Uh, right. But nowadays, they, I think they do clean it better because it's not so obvious. So as you, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting because you and I think like Nick and even like Ben and these guys, you all kind of travel the world and so you Nick get to... is my best student. He came to me right in the beginning and we sat for days. And, uh, that's what I really like, you know? And he went far beyond, you know, goes beyond what I did. So, French, so yeah. what, what has he done that you're like proud of your student? Like what, what things have you seen him do where you're like... The way he sets he's things up and, and he, he just only makes... He, he refuses to do any second grade. He only wants to make top grade stuff. And for sure, he does it with a lot of care and more care than most people at home will have. And so it's definitely a much better quality. And it's interesting because hash as a business, if you want to adhere to those high standards, you kind of by default have to be a small business because there's not enough quality source material yeah. to keep the levels up all yeah. the time. Yeah. Yeah.
And so is this your preferred, like you like to smoke spliffs basically? Yes, because right. that's how I started your European. in 64 yeah, yeah. and that's how yeah, everybody yeah. smokes in Europe. So I lived in France for two years. Uh, and everybody smokes joints, spliffs. Yeah, no, yeah. And, and, and coming from the US where you're ripping tubes, you know, you're, you're yeah. bongs and prototypes and baddies and joints. And all these dabbing rigs it, and it, all the rest it, of it. It would <laughs> knock me over the head. But then interestingly, if I offer them flour, like here, let's roll a joint, they'd be like, whoa, that is way too powerful for us. They don't uh, smoke it pure. They right. also add some tobacco to their flour. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's European way. So, but and I started smoking like that 55 years ago and still smoke like that. <laughs> yeah. And how many, And but do you smoke tobacco by itself? Or are you ever no. like, I just need it? So it's always- I used to, yeah, but no. And so now you just smoke splits, and how many do you think you smoke a day? Well, at the moment I'm on a program to lessen the, the tobacco. Is that so, by doctor's order? No, 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 by my own Self-imposed. Uh, yes. No, according to my doctor, I'm fine and healthy, and he refuses to give me any kind of piece of paper than for medical use. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so every packet of tobacco, I buy these European packets, I give myself 0.1 gram less for that whole packet. So at the beginning of the year, I was up to five, six grams a day, and now I'm down to 1.7 gram of tobacco a day. But the same amount of hash per day? I'm not trying to cut the hash, right. but yeah, for sure it's less. So, so, and out so, of that well, 1.7... So, so how much hash do you go through in a day? Probably at least a gram or so, I never really looked at right. it that much okay. but from that 1.7 gram I can make eight little joints so that keeps and, me happy and are you still making hash or are you kind of no. all your students and former students are giving you what they make and you just sometimes in Amsterdam I have to go to the coffee shop and buy it and I can't even what? afford the best quality they make you buy it? Hash. Yeah. and I can't even afford to buy their best quality uh, hash like this one yeah. Man, they have so much money. <laughs> That's crazy. Ah, sometimes they'll give me some. And a lot of former people who bought my equipment and live in Holland are forever wanting to show me how wonderful their new product is coming along. Right. So I do get, uh, yeah, most of it. Well, tell me this. What, what I was getting at before with kind of a crew of you who, who travel the world, you're almost like a touring band that gets to experience different scenes and cultures. So yeah. like, can you tell me about the scenes you're seeing? I mean, you're, you've, I mean, you're only in LA for like a day, but like, you know, Miami, uh, the Netherlands, you know, Amsterdam, Barcelona, you're about to go to, to where in Bogota? Or? No, no, I could fly to Monteria and then my girlfriend, she's waiting at the airport and drive me straight to the boat because the Dabadu is on an island. That and is because of coming here, I'm arriving two days later in Colombia. So, but this way, at so least you're I'll be, be there. Fashionably late to... No, no, actually, I'll be there for the beginning of the okay. Dabadu. Just. <laughs> Have you been to Colombia? Oh, yeah, several times. Yeah. So, tell me about the scene that you're seeing, whether it's the cultivation scene, the hash scene, the social scene in these different uh, countries or cities yeah i don't like cities much if there is any spare time i prefer to go out in the woods or the wild or something and see something of the countryside but um i think everywhere uh, now this uh, whole idea of making ash is just growing quite explosively. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the other day somebody gave me my best compliment ever, I guess. Uh, Mila started making ash and the whole world followed. <laughs> right. It's not quite like You're that, You're like the Pied Piper. <laughs> but I think with this machine it did start also, not only copied me, but uh, got people got other inventions on the road and you know, the whole, uh, all the equipment for the extracts, all that came along and... The dab rigs and the... The dab rigs, some fantastic dab rigs, yeah. But I'm not really a dabber. For me, it's like smoking uh, two old joints in one puff. Right. And then also, although now I've learned how to get around that, the way that people cough after taking a dab sometime, 
my 74 year old lungs can't do with that. Maybe once, but not too often. The way some people go like, rah, rah, and then say, that was a good one. <laughs> yeah, they, they embrace the cough. Exactly. Like the more painful the cough, the better it is for you. Exactly. Well, I don't want those painful coughs anymore. <laughs> so, so, all right, but talk, talk about, um, like I'm dying to go down to Columbia. Uh, yeah. So talk, talk about the scene down there. Um, they'll be waiting for me. And like, like, like who, so, who? so the thing is, wherever I travel, I've already got like, uh, sometimes there's a whole group of people waiting at the airport. Uh, tomorrow I know because it's all last minute arranged. They'll be my girlfriend, but I've never had to arrive in a place and look for a hotel. Let me right. put it like that. <laughs> so, but, but who are some of the people like Nick lives in NorCal, he's yeah. a friend of yours. Yeah. Uh, who, who's down in South America that you love, that, that you respect as a hash maker, as yes. a cultivator, as a friend? There is uh, definitely quite a bunch of them there. I mean, all these people, people who have put in time and energy to put together a Dabadu, I love them. You know, without them, it wouldn't be happening. And I know how much work it is to put anything like that right. together. Uh, uh, then I know El Gato from Colombia already since 89 when he phoned me from Medellin and said I'm phoning you from Medellin and I want to order the biggest pollinator dry sift machine you got. I said okay I need a credit card and a address and sure enough five minutes later he calls back credit card. And this guy has grown so much weed in South America. So by the way it took him five months to get the credit card. The five minutes. Oh, five minutes later. He phoned he me back oh, five thought, minutes. I thought you said five months no, later. No, no, five like, minutes He's like, I deal in all later. cash. Let no, me no, see no. if I can find a credit card or no. a bank. He had that. And then first he was growing in Colombia, and he showed me this beautiful footage of how he's riding to his mountainside. They grow mountainsides on there on his horse. <laughs> Just lovely. And uh, then he moved to Mexico, Brazil, and I think he... But wherever he moved to and started growing, he needed my machines. He was making hash uh, quite a big way. And uh, he's a close friend. He, uh, and where does he live now? He lives in Colombia. Oh, so he's back in Colombia. Okay, yeah. got it. He was in Barcelona for a while, but he's Colombian, I think. He feels at home in Colombia. <laughs> and uh, I'll be staying with him after the Dabadu for a bit. And I've got a girlfriend there and her kids are the same age as my granddaughter, so she works or she has a marijuana farm now, supposedly working for the government. I haven't seen her so for a year, so we'll see. But I'll stay there. And who who are kind of some of the old school people from the Amsterdam scene that you're still in touch with? Um, like like Ben I Ben Ben uh, Drunkers from Sensi. Mm -hmm. uh, Ariane, all those guys from these seed companies, because we all... He still lives in Amsterdam, right? Yeah, okay. I mean, we were all kind of more or less there from the beginning, so every High Times Cup, we'd run into each other. Every uh, Spanibus, we'd run into each other. Some of these guys I saw more away from Amsterdam <laughs> than in Amsterdam. Right. <laughs> but uh, we all known each other for like 20 years, 25 years now. So most of them are still going strong. Some of them have dropped along the way. Some of them are living on tropical islands now. <laughs> Can't be bothered. <laughs> Don't need to. So talk about kind of the corporatization of, it's not just of cannabis, but like for example, the High Times event last night, when you first were on the High Times scene, it was probably a lot different people than you're seeing there today where like now it's kind of like finance guys who own it and run it I and know. are basically co-opting kind of... But I was at the Grow uh, Expo in Holland uh, a few months ago and everybody's also walking around in suits with ties on and uh, the whole atmosphere has changed. The whole atmosphere. You talk to CEOs instead of someone who's enthusiastic about his nutrients. <laughs> right. Before you'd go up to a booth and he'd say, oh man, you got to try my stuff, you'll get the best buds ever. 
Now you're having to deal with the CEO. <laughs> it's just different. And maybe for me personally, I preferred it the old way. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's the world. Times change. And I watch TV here the last couple of evenings, and it's just boggling what's all going on. So besides Nick, who are kind of some hash makers that yeah, this Gato, he makes also great hash. But so does Ben, you know. And uh, actually in uh, Miami it was quite a bit, quite difficult in a way because uh, none of them were really bad, you know. <laughs> and uh, So you're trying to pick from all good entries, basically. Something like that, right. yeah. yeah. <coughs> well, one was better than the other, but... Um, but when you're judging... <coughs> I don't like to judge. I'm such a bad judge. But, but, but when you do, <laughs> how are you consuming it? Are you, are you putting it in I your smoke spliff? I smoke a spliff of each type and put a number on it and then smoke a bit of each one and then decide which one I like best and which but one. But like how many entrants were there For in this, there were only five. Okay, so you're not smoking like 30 spliffs. Sometimes okay. I have to. <laughs> but usually, actually, I don't fault. I just like to be the hostess and talk to people and hang out with them. But uh, they got me on. So, the, so each judge gets to smoke it in however they prefer to smoke it. So if I'm a spliff smoker, if I'm a dabber, if I'm a whatever. Most of them dab it. Most of them dab it. Or, um, yeah. So, but like I say, I'm such a bad uh, judge. I don't really like to be a judge. <laughs> I went through those five and decided which one was worst and which one was best. Went through them again and completely changed my mind. You know, and then after the third time, I had to come to some decision. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the first one was quite obvious, but it was especially about the two that came after that. Right. So getting back to like the traditional hash producing countries, because I think a lot of what people talk about is kind of the Dutch seeds, basically like Genghis Khan impregnating all the females and mixing and yeah, creating yeah, yeah. hybrid bastards in all those countries so like what what were some of the experiences that really stand out for you in terms of like i was in the mountains of this region and we smoked some hash and it was just the most amazing thing i've ever had and and, and yes. i can't find it since then like, like is there something that you can't find today that well i must say about that i really kind of feel bad that all these people are taking their homey seeds to Afghanistan to everywhere and I'm sure in the end the whole world will just be like one standard if it goes on like this right. because like in Manali Valley it's a valley so if somebody plants uh, 20 cookie plants or a white widow or whatever it's going to affect all the plants in the whole valley in the end might take a couple generations but it will so I find that very sad but I did have uh, one of my best experiences there in the same Manali Valley in the 60s, uh, late 60s when I got there. We used to hang out with many of the sadhus, the holy men with their hair on top that smoked chillings yeah. all day long in uh, respect for Shiva. And they took us up into the mountains to rub, but they all rub up there. And so they're they making charas? Yes. Okay. And I didn't like in the valley, you had all these big green plants like meters high, they weren't into that. And they took us up and we found two of these, like a little dell in the mountainside that was like a little hollow. And it had been filled with snow the whole winter. And underneath, the marijuana plants had survived. Now they weren't shooting up meters high. They were like bonsais, all crinkly and woody and knobbly. The, 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 this is during harvest season, like in October, November, the, or this no, is in this like was February? In, no, no, this was in October. Okay. And the buds weren't very big either. They were like this size. And each plant would have quite a number of buds. Anyway, we rubbed the hash there and then with the sadhus, they made the chillum immediately. So I realize also that's probably some of the few times that I've smoked hash so freshly that the um, uh, THCA is still very much there. Anyway, we smoked a couple of chillums up there and walking down that mountain, it was like an acid trip. 
the way the brook was bubbling next to us, it was, and the way the colors were, it was just amazing. Yeah, that was the... But, and the other thing I always say, the smoke joint I'm smoking right now is the best. Because all the rest is in the past or in the future. Or, uh, so, <laughs> so be in the present. Is the best. Be yes. in the present. Exactly. So, so ha have you gone back to some of those regions and visited old friends in, yeah, in yeah, yeah. you know, Kashmir and... No, in Manali, like, uh, I used to go trekking a lot with my kids because they all went to school there. So in the summer, we'd go trekking. And, and this is like in, in the, the 70s ways. or...? Yeah, in okay. the 70s, 80s. And uh, a lot of times we went with this one guy who owned uh, five or six horses and put all the food and the tents on there and we'd walk. And he's in my book. And so I uh, sent him a book and it actually made it. <laughs> so that's so nice. He can't read English, but he can look at the pictures and there's a picture of him in there. That's funny. Yeah. Well, I guess the question I'm asked or I'm going to ask is, what do you think's the future for those people, right? Like these are, because now you have all these like, I mean, here in LA, yeah. you have all these young kids making hash and it, it, it's you. a global market. Like, is there an, well, and, and the other you, question went, is, are, are those people doing some of the, are they still dry sifting or are they all making ice water hash now too? No. Um, I went because my sister decided to make a documentary and uh, it was about me. So we went back to some of these old places and actually met some of the same people, but they're still doing exactly the same that they were like 30 years earlier. So they're still dry sifting and... Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, the no, traditional they're, they're, they're techniques. still rubbing, yeah. Or right in yeah, there, yeah, they're rubbing. Yeah. But um, the thing is what I realized when I was there 30, 35 years ago, nothing had changed in 500 years. There was more change in those 35 years than there had been in the preceding 500. You know, when I, we went there, there was just walking paths from one village to the next. Now there's roads, buses, electricity, more schools, more hospitals. But all the young kids there want to get into the tourist trade and drive around in a Jeep. Right. Forget about the house. <laughs> they want to be in a Jeep. Right. And in a way, it's very sad because a lot of the tradition will get lost this way. Do, do you still smoke dry sift? Yes. And, and how would you, like, when do you like dry sift? Like, do you just appreciate both and they're both great? Like ice water you, versus dry sift? Or? I'll tell you for me what the difference is. Uh, maybe Frenchie and Nicotine would uh, have different opinion. But for me, when you make a, if people like the aroma and where the smell and the taste is most important to them when they smoke, they should take dry sift. Because I believe probably a lot of the terpenes are on the outside of the trichome. And so all the water soluble ones will get washed off in the water. The sad part of it is in the dry sift that very quickly the little sticks will start coming through the screen also and you can do a lot of work and remove them. But if I smoke it like that, it kind of tastes fuzzy. Now with uh, water hash, there's not as many terpenes, there's no sticks. It tastes less, it smells less, but it's stronger. So I prefer that. <laughs> so, but, but they each have trade-offs, right? Like there, yeah, there, there's, yeah, there, the there's no is, holy grail. One has more flavor and terpenes, the other is pure and just has more strength. It is a bit like that. Probably if you mix the two, you'd get the perfect thing, but I just like it like this, and it's stronger than the dry sift. Uh, although I must say, at, in uh, Miami, um, a Cuban... Cuban grower? Grower's wife sent me some dry sift that she had made, and that was very good. But it was so good, there was definitely no leather sticks in it. And in the temperature, it melted just like this and got just like this. Now, do you, if people are gifting you stuff everywhere, are you traveling with it? No. Okay. So you Nowadays, basically, I never do. 
So I whatever whatever you whatever you don't finish, behind. you'll give to these two lucky or three lucky guys over there <laughs> well, who have no idea what what to do with it. No, no, they wouldn't get it. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it with Dougie or something. <laughs> ah, good, good, okay. And at the moment, I don't know if I've got to last me through to the time I leave it, Dougie. I only have like two, three spliffs left. Otherwise, if I had had more, I would give you some. I'm but sure Doug has a, plenty at his uh, house. Yeah, but I need to roll a spliff before I get on the thing to um, the cab to go to the airport. And I don't like to bug him the whole time. Oh, I want another smoke. He already gave me. I'm and sure <laughs> you would be. I'm sure Doug would be honored to share some of his okay, cash with you. Okay, I'll give you his. <laughs> You've already got some of that. Oh, you're gonna get. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Because you're right, if I do need another junk when I'm up there, oh, sorry, so, I don't so have it. Th this is Cuban grower's wife? No, no, that I already finished in uh, Miami. Oh, here it is. And this is who? This is from Doug. Oh, Doug made this? Yeah, well, I don't know if he made it. He was the one that gave it to me. Uh -huh. Okay. So at the moment, I've got some of this and some of that. So. Now you have it. That's good. <laughs> well, thank you. I have some of this left, and if it ain't enough, you're right. Doug will happily well, give me Well, you can call me, and I'll, I'll drive up to Doug's and, and hand off for your last split. But I appreciate it, and I will let you make your flight down to Columbia. Yeah. Just quickly, where where are the five this year? So They're there's Miami, Peru, Peru, and Costa Rica and Mexico. I did before I went to Miami. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Thank you.